That's fine. And now, are we starting? Yes, we can start. Okay, just stop with the big hand. And the order says go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yes, welcome yet again to another learning session. Today we're going to be listening to Jona. Thank you for being here, Jona. She's one of the most active MVPs in the, in the at least, Nordic countries. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for uh, agreeing to this. Uh, it's a really interesting topic about resiliency and uh, serverless in the same sentence. Pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the agenda, short and sweet. Uh, quick intro, this is it. Uh, then you will do your presentation. Then we will end it. We will eat some pizza. We will discuss and mingle. Um, and uh, just a quick intro about Asha Skåne. Uh, do we have any first joiners today? Oh, welcome. welcome. Awesome. Uh, so it's all about learning, having fun, uh, networking. Everyone's welcome. Uh, no prerequisites at all. You know, so pretty nice. Uh, Asha Skåne crew, once arranging these meetings, it's us. My name is Michael. I'm from my work at Microsoft, the next MVP. We have uh, Negar, she's present. Uh, yeah, you can tell your story in the, in the pause. <laughs> uh, we have Goran and we have Magnus. Uh, they're not present today, but they're also part of the team. If you have any tips, tricks, uh, topics you want us to try to cover and so on, you just reach out and uh, let's see if we can arrange something. If you tweet, put a post on LinkedIn, anything about this meeting, about your engagement here, uh, please use the hashtag. It's always nice when you search for the hashtag and you see all the engagement. Uh, yes. So you're welcome to use that one. Hi, Hi welcome. Hi. Um, Hi. We're present on LinkedIn, on uh, Twitter, on YouTube. So this session will end up at YouTube. And if you go into YouTube and s you can look at all our previous sessions, I think 98% have been recorded. So good stuff there. <coughs> We have sponsors, of course, Fou Cafe, that's arranging this one and uh, doing the pizza. And then we have Capiche. We actually do the pizza. Yeah. <laughs> you do the pizza. Uh, Mickey just uh, offers uh, us to be here. You pull the crowd and we bring the pizza. Uh, for this <laughs> year, uh, Capiche is just 100 meters away. We are a software development uh, company. And you can ask Dennis, who's uh, from the development team about our technology, but we're building a graph database that's very good for exploring and visualizing scientific data, especially in life science. And usually I say, we're here to recruit, but today we aren't because we have our pipeline full, thanks to oh. Mick and the team. <laughs> okay, over and out. Nice. And as a thank you for being curious and learning, we are uh, giving you an NFT, non-fungible token. And if you're not grabbing it now, you, we can always talk about it in the while having uh, some food. Uh, but it's a nice thing to have. Maybe and you and I, she's also very uh, pro uh, advocating this uh, learner badges, so yes. she can also tell you what it's all about. Yeah. So. The next thing, upcoming meetups. We're in the middle of summer soon, or beginning of summer. And during summer, people have other interests than learning about new technology. But we have a, a very diligent person in the community that's going to drive a, a digital bootcamp, IoT digital bootcamp. Okay. Uh, you want to say some words about it? Okay, uh, yeah, well, uh, summer is lovely and uh, everybody loves it, so what's better to do than learn IoT? And I've been working with that for the past uh, months and uh, kind of like it. So I thought that I could spend uh, a few hours um, 
doing a project or two and uh, sharing some knowledge and uh, I would be very very happy to to share it with uh, all of you uh, who are here and uh, those listening online and then you see on day five there we're going to have a summary of what we did and how it worked or didn't work which uh, I think yeah it's uh, quite a uh, quite possible that it won't work but we will finish with a beer uh, there uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, now a lot of more details to come, but uh, if you don't have anything to do in July, then maybe you you could join. And the details we will send out uh, on Meetup and so on. Uh, and if you want to speak, if you have a topic, if you know someone that should be come here and speak, we have an open ongoing session. I you know, or just reach out to us. We're always looking for people to speak here. We have our Discord, free to join it, really good. A lot of discussions and news. With that, let's get started. It's yes. your turn, Jonah. Yes, thank you. Should we like shorten this one because I'm a short woman? <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> I'm no. curious. No, okay. I'll stand on this side. <laughs> no, it's not. No, okay. Let's uh, try. Okay, let me just uh, connect this one. Is it working? Oh, we need to. We need to do my. Yes, I think it you can. Oh, uh, uh, Michael said you can't, so it's I think it's okay. Oh, yeah. oh that's fine. Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's that's okay. That's good. I can look, and uh, that's fine. It's okay. I need, I like to move anyway. <laughs> Can you, am I look? Um, uh, do I look okay there? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. What's this? Um, let me just turn this on. Okay, great. I was actually in a, in a conference yesterday, so it's like yeah, conference yesterday and then meet up today. But I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I see my friends, a few friends uh, in this community. Uh, joining and I'm so happy to be here in Malmo. This is actually my first time in Malmo. Uh, I live in Sundsvall, Sweden, but I'm, I traveled to Malmo <laughs> from uh, Copenhagen uh, today because I had a, a talk in Code Garden, which is in Denmark. So uh, today uh, I'm very happy and honored, humbled also to be collaborating with Asher Skone in uh, sharing knowledge uh, about Azure uh, functions or Azure durable functions, which is one of the serverless compute uh, topic that I like to speak about often. Who among you here have worked with Azure functions? Oh, maybe I, you're, maybe I'm, you can join me on the stage <laughs> so you can uh, share about this. But that's good. Uh, that means that uh, if there is something, maybe some of the basics you know already, but we can always discuss. And if there's something, uh, maybe af after the session, we can also uh, exchange ideas and uh, discuss problems. So uh, making sense of serverless. So as you all know, we working with Azure Functions and serverless, we are, actually hearing this uh, cliche that serverless is just uh, a cliche word where, where it is often used for marketing, like in a way that, hey, you're, you're using serverless is very popular. But actually serverless uh, means that you are removing the infrastructure behind uh, the logic so that developers can focus on uh, developing with uh, the business logic that needs to be delivered in the application and at the same time, uh, like, don't worry about uh, the infrastructure. So the goal that we have today is to learn about Azure Durable Functions. 
So most of you raised your hands and said that you worked with Azure functions, but specifically in this talk, we're going to learn about uh, durable functions. Have you worked with durable functions? A few? Yes. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. So we will also learn, aside from the basics of uh, durable functions, uh, we will also learn about application design patterns that you need to know when you're trying to design or write code for durable functions. And these are application design patterns that you can use to solve complex problems in, in terms of building stateful workflows with functions. And uh, developing how what to think about and a few use cases and a few examples about uh, uh, about uh, scale scalability in serverless. So a few of you here are knows me. So my name is uh, Jonah Anderson. I I'm I'm from Sweden, uh, in Sundsvall. Who who has been to Sundsvall? Metal, metal <laughs> All right, yeah. So it's so it's my first time to be south in Sweden, so I'm very happy to be here. But uh, in mid north Sweden and since well, I'm, uh, I work as an IT consultant and uh, work with different things, uh, development. And as Mick Michael said, I'm very active also as a Microsoft MVP, sharing knowledge to everybody in conferences and I also built Azure User Group Sweden under the pandemic and just like Mikael in this group we do our bi-weekly session but virtual uh, since I'm the only Azure MVP in Sundsvall and I didn't have anybody to collaborate with so I collaborated with another MVP in Norway so it's like see how technology actually like connect us together so I believe that uh, serverless actually solve a lot of problems, like for example, scalability challenges that we have, uh, concurrency, uh, racing conditions, as well as uh, deadlock problems that we often experience as uh, developers. And I do believe that serverless solutions and Azure functions are good uh, solutions uh, for that, like especially in event-driven or microservice services architecture scenarios. So we're Swedes. Uh, I often, when I speak about Azure Functions, I always compare this comparison of architecture between monolithic uh, from left to right, from monolithic, the traditional way that we are used to, and then the microservices, containers, and serverless. And then the purpose why I'm sharing this with you is not because like to make you hungry before we eat pizza, uh, because we usually eat pizza first before fika. <laughs> but my purpose is actually to compare that monolithic, for example, it is like a layered cake or like traditional uh, infrastructure that we have. Maybe this layer is uh, the data layer. Uh, this one is the application layer and this one is the logic maybe. But if one of those layers, like the application or the business logic, including the database, gets broken, like let's just say it fall off from the from carrying it and it fall off, just like an IT traditional IT infrastructure, then it means the entire system goes down and your users are not able to use the system. So that's the the dilemma that we often face in a monolithic architecture uh, in this scenario. And the microservices, it's like uh, as you already know, we are all developers. The purpose is like each uh, cupcake or service has its own purpose, like user, uh, a service that handles users, a service that handles uh, billing and uh, so on and so forth. And containers, they're like, yeah, we have a container expert here, right? <laughs> so the containers are like, uh, uh, like a box of cookies. You have everything in there. It could be like a window, I mean, an old uh, infrastructure, IT, IT application that you want to move to the cloud and containerize it in any way like Docker or uh, using in different uh, container services that we have. And then there's also serverless, which is very uh, popular, especially in uh, in Azure, as well as in AWS, uh, like serverless community. So serverless are like the the small cookie, I mean, small candies or goodies that we get during pause, <laughs> where you can just like, if you want something sweet where you're on the go, on the train or on the bus, you can just grab it and then it's there. 
and then just like also building serverless or event-driven solution for for an application and integrate it from one app to maybe talk to the API to get something, then it's also like service. You can build it quickly, even if you have, uh, even if you're just getting started uh, in uh, development. So there are so many ways to do it. But the purpose of this comparison uh, is actually control versus productivity. So, of course, if you're in a monolithic architecture, you have more control. But if, as the more you choose on this path, the more developers, us developers, are productive in delivering what the business value for others. And the main the main reason why many are considering it it's because faster to deliver to the business. And it's also quicker uh, in our sprints. Uh, there was a book, uh, I was in uh, Server Last Days Belfast uh, in February. And then it was in the Game of Thrones studios. And I got the copy of this book and one of the organizer was the author, David Anderson. And the fo he has this book, uh, the, Fly the Valley of Flywheel Effect. And it's about uh, like uh, truly understand, really, uh, like explaining to the organization about the value of modern cloud and serverless. And he had a quote in his book that actually caught my attention and kind of like almost true because he said, unfortunately, too many people in IT write code, build system and perform tasks without any idea why. They obsess over function and forget about the purpose. And if you're a developer, you might be wondering what is he trying to tell us here? We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but I but later on I actually understood his point that sometimes as developers we want to truly understand what our what we're doing in our uh, our tasks about the purpose. And I'm a type of developer actually that that should, that want to understand what my uh, logic is, or functionality is really doing and what is the value of my solution or my creation to the end user. So it's like a, a developer who cares uh, some uh, like way. So here was the point that he has that uh, as we enter to the era of business and technology, uh, it is irresponsible for a modern organization to ignore and even waste the potential and the effectiveness and the business value and the power of serverless of modern cloud that it gives. So I really like that because there, I, the, one of the reasons that I also wrote my book in Ash, about Azure, it's because I want to uh, help organizations like uh, build something that will give them value at the same time, accelerate their purpose in, in terms of uh, uh, technology that we have today and serverless and modern cloud are good good things that can help build solutions. So speaking of serverless, uh, those of you are familiar with Azure Functions already, right? So Azure Functions is this one. The standard Azure Functions is like, it's the, the logic of your code plus the events and data. So events can be uh, any Anything that happens from any event that happens, for example, your an HTTP trigger from a call from your application during an event click or something. And on the other hand, durable functions is actually the extension of it. And what it does is it actually uh, is for building or designing stateful uh, workflows in serverless. So what, what, it, what it can do that the sister, the younger sister, Azure Functions ca cannot do is actually the state management. So if you're building a workflow that you want to take control and want to have control uh, and keeps a state, which is this one, this part, the state management, then uh, durable functions is uh, a good uh, alternative. And I'm a consultant, and then I often ask, what's the best solution for this and that? And usually our common answer is like, it depends, right? So that's like the typical IT consultant uh, answer. And um, the, the, the languages that durable functions support are these languages. So if you're doing .NET, C Sharp, 
PowerShell. We have a PowerShell guru here in the room, I know. You can also uh, develop that uh, well, with it this as well. And then the, res uh, the technology behind uh, durable functions are actually the durable task framework, which is an open source uh, library that you can check through this repository. And you can actually see the code base behind the technology, this, this framework uh, in, in durable functions. Let's do a quick check or see that since we have Azure experts here, let's do an interaction. What do you think is the difference between uh, st stateful and stateless? Um, yes, go ahead. Yes, anybody else? Yes, that's a good that, that's a good answer. Yes, thank you, thank you for that. So, uh, in addition to that, I would like also to add in the concept of uh, durable functions is that in uh, durable functions, for example, it's considered stateful because there is an orchestrator. So this is where, like you used to say, this is the the orchestrator where you write or author your workflow as a developer. This is where you decide whatever pattern that works suits for your business case. And this is the activities or the function itself. I mean, the pattern really depends. But here, stateless, it's like a, it can be like a standard function that can be an HTTP trigger, a blog trigger. They're kind of like by themselves. And if this is like maybe hosted in a different a resource group or region or a virtual uh, virtual uh, like container, uh, if it loses its state and you don't actually have control about what's going on in that specific function. But in Orchestrator, you have the state management and keep and have control over that. The longer answer version. <laughs> yes. So when you get started uh, developing uh, durable functions, there are actually different types. So you cannot just like, hey, I want to start uh, coding durable functions and uh, you need to know where, what it, the, the entire architecture, what are the types that you need to have. And there are actually, uh, actually three, but this one is usually used for uh, like uh, .NET uh, in keeping stateful uh, entities. But the first one that's important is the client function. So client functions uh, can be like, it's actually a standard function. It's the starting point of your orchestrator. So it can be your uh, a Cosmos DB trigger that actually kickstarts your orchestrator function. I said functions here because you can have uh, several uh, as well. Um, orchestrator functions, their, their purpose is that you write the, the workflow uh, in there. And this is where you author what you want to do. And then the activity functions are the basic unit of tasks that you want to perform in your uh, orchestration. Durable entities, uh, it's commonly used for stateful uh, entities in uh, .NET. Have you tried? Any of you have tried? Not not me so much, but I know it's very useful if you have like uh, if you're trying to talk to the database, and um, it, you're trying to talk to the database and you want to talk uh, do the entities with uh, with state in it. Uh, I cannot deep dive in it because I myself haven't uh, done it so much. But these three are the key things. If you're new to Azure Functions, these three are uh, the three types that you need to know. So which means that you cannot ha just write an orchestrator functions without building uh, the durable client. So I have a Filipino background. I came from the Philippines and then I moved to Sweden 11 years ago. So, but I still have the culture in me, but I want to share about this dance. It's called Tinikling. It is actually a traditional dance in the Philippines where they dance with bamboo. So you see, they have to be orchestrated. Otherwise, they will break their foot, maybe. <laughs> yes. But uh, the tinikling dance, like the Philippine traditional folk dance uh, that we got actually as an influence in, in Spain, 
it, I can compare it to the orchestrator because everything in the orchestrator needs to be orchestrated, right? So, so this is like how you design it. Uh, all the things that each task, like that dancer, this one needs to be all the choreography, just like an orchestra, it needs to be uh, coordinated. So this is uh, a good uh, example of the orchestrator. So the orchestrator uh, is our is very helpful in building the stateful workflow. Workflow, but then he or she I'm doing the 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 both gender because I'm diverse. <laughs> uh, he or she, the orchestrator, is helpful, but he actually is strict because when we code the the or we when we code or we design our workflow it needs to be deterministic, which means deterministic means that it expects the same result all the time, especially when it is replayed. And it is replayed every time a new event happens, uh, like uh, if it's an HTTP trigger, when an HTTP request happens, or if it's a Cosmos DB trigger, when the new data comes into your uh, Cosmos DB uh, database, or IoT. A trigger, right? <laughs> so IoT is also something that's very commonly used in terms of uh, event-driven uh, development. So there are do's and don'ts for durable functions because of this deterministic character of the orchestrator. Uh, we need to know the things that we need to consider in terms of coding it, like I'm a .NET developer, so I'm focused in .NET. So this like constraints are actually based on .NET. But if you want to know the different constraints based on like different languages, or so if you're doing PowerShell or Java, there's actually entire documentation of con all constraints depending on the language. But just basing on .NET, uh, what what is recommended based on this uh, constraints is that when you're writing uh, like your orchestrator, you don't want to break the the rule of it needs to be deterministic. And these things like uh, generating random numbers or grid or having your database configurations uh, in the orchestrator uh, like function, blocking APIs and definitely not have infinite loops within the orchestrator. Uh, and I think you can understand why, because it will be replayed, right? The, or the orchestration. And then the current date time, uh, we do have this like standard function in .NET, but then if you're using durable functions, you need to call it from uh, from the durable context uh, class and call this method uh, named uh, current UTC date time. And this is in .NET, but I think it's called or the syntax is different in, in Java or other language. So what you can do instead, like let's just say, hey, I want to repeat something in, in the orchestration. I mean, why is it I'm not allowed, Jonah? I want to do for each loop in my orchestra orchestrator. What you can do ex instead, I mean, you know, the creators of this are pretty smart because they thought about it <laughs> because of this purpose. So in the context itself as well, a durable orchestration context, there's actually a method called create as new. And I can show a few examples uh, of that uh, in this presentation. So what's really happening behind the scene? So I think you're, if you're familiar working with uh, Azure Functions as most of you uh, have worked on in your uh, development, of course. So what's really behind the scene is that a function app each of them is actually connected to a storage account. So um, my experience, uh, because I also do infrastructure as code by Terraform, uh, and when you create a function app, either by infrastructure as code or even manually or using the CLI uh, or the cloud shell, you can, when you build a function app, it usually creates uh, a storage account. And in the storage account, be inside it, there is actually task hub in it where all the the logs or orchestration data in your Azure functions are are, are saved. 
And if you notice the side by side of this, a function app needs to have like an associated task hub, but then two task hub or this this pairing can be in one storage account. So you can have multiple task hub in one uh, storage account, but you need to have one task hub associated per function app. So you cannot have one function, one task hub, and then you can have multiple talking to this. So they kind of like need to have its like own container or like storage. And in terms of scaling and event-driven scaling, so this is the, uh, the different ways how uh, behind the scenes, how Azure Functions are actually using a uh, scale controller in terms of uh, scaling events uh, within Azure Functions. So let's just say you have this all, all triggers for blob, queue, timer, service bus, uh, event hub. And what it does, it monitors the events uh, through the scale con controller. And every time an event happens, then it creates uh, a host instance and then uh, it does uh, uh, its thing. So I'm just trying to highlight here without digging into the details, what's happening behind is that it's the scales controller that actually scales uh, the scalability within Azure Functions in each event uh, of that. Who among you have, I've heard some of you maybe have heard about the, the different uh, patterns. So once you already have, uh, you know, the the types of uh, Azure, func Azure durable functions, those things, the client, the orchestrator, and the activities, you also need to kind of like uh, get an overview about the different patterns. So there are actually at least six documented as of today. So there's this pattern commonly used for durable functions. It's called function chaining. There's the fan out, fan in. Uh, there's the async HTTP API. There is the monitoring pattern, human interaction, and then uh, the aggregator pattern. So let's start with function chaining. So function chaining, of course, is pretty obvious, right? It's like uh, a chain. So this is function one, function two, function three, function four, and what this pattern does is that if you have something or an event that requires execution of activities or functions that needs to be in specific order, then this is uh, a pattern that you can use. And there are certain use cases or scenarios that this is actually uh, useful. For example, you need uh, you need an in input, I mean, function two needs an input from function one in order to process farther into the next one. In C sharp, this is actually how function chaining uh, works. So you have, this is the context that I was talking about in the, uh, in the constraints. So usually if you have an orchestrator, it has a function name and then uh, it uses the orchestration trigger and this orchestration trigger is actually triggered from the durable client, like the event uh, happening, the first type that I showed. And in the context, this is where your a lot of stuff are being saved uh, from the orchestration instance. And for the function chaining, let's just say this is a simple snippet example from uh, from Microsoft Docs. And in here, what it's trying to do is like X, Y, Z. It's trying to call a different function, function one, function two, function three, and four. And the first uh, function doesn't need any parameter, it's null. But then the function two is actually expecting the result of X. And then the function three is expecting the result of Y, so on and so forth. And then what it does is that this is the function four gives the final result based on the sequence of things that are being passed on between all of the functions from function one to function four. And this is just a simple example, like it's just to, to simplify it, but this can be as complex as you design it, depending on what you're trying to do in your event-driven applications. 
and this is one uh, one uh, mini <laughs> example of it. So let's just say you have uh, a blob, a storage that gets triggered when you upload a blob. And that blob can be an image, it can be a document. And when a document is uploaded, that, that means you have an event, right? So it gets triggered. What it does, let's just say this, this uh, solution is trying to notify uh, people or save something in service bus uh, when when a new blob is uploaded. So it kickstarts the orchestration and then you designed your orchestrator to have a function chaining. So in your function chaining, through the context, you pass in your blob image data or details, whatever you want to save, like URL maybe. And then you can do whatever you want. In this simple example, you can choose to like uh, save that, uh, that data in the uh, in a service bus maybe, uh, and then save it in a queue. And then you can also like use other APIs like Twilio or SendGrid or uh, other other Azure services like Azure Logic Ops or even like Event Hubs or even other like uh, Azure IoT or something. So there's a lot of things. This is just a mini example, but I did show an example of different things like Azure service. This is a third party service. And this is also another API that's commonly used for uh, sending emails to show to you that uh, you can also integrate durable functions outside or in different types of uh, services. And I do actually have a template for this with an example code that I can show you later if our time permits. Uh, I think I need a time check because I, some, this is a topic that I'm passionate about, but uh, I think Mika will stop me if I talk too much, that's great. <laughs> All right, so uh, function chaining in action. What's really going on in function chaining? We're just in one pattern right now. So function chaining in action, because it's, it looks so simple, right? A chain of function, this from left to right, but what is really going on? So function chaining, in action actually is like a lot of things. I mean, not a lot of things, but there is actually a secret <laughs> happening uh, behind it. So I want to show it to you. So let's just say you have, since we have an IoT comp coming soon. <laughs> so let's just say you have an event coming from your IoT and you have this IoT trigger. So what it does, it triggered the orchestrator. So when the orchestrator is started, you have an activity maybe to send the telemetry to uh, to a database or to inform user, show it in a user, in a UI. So when the orchestration has started, what it does is that the first activity, of course, is scheduled and does its thing. But behind the scene, the orchestrator is sleeping. So while activity one is busy, the orchestrator sleeps. When the activity one is done, the orchestrator wakes up. When activity two is scheduled and ready, ready to do its ta task, the orchestrator sleeps again. Activity two is done, orchestration is completed. And this is just a, a simple example that there are two activities that you need to do. And then the entire orchestration will be replayed, as you see. When a new event happens. So this is where the deterministic uh, design that you implement in your code uh, is valuable and helpful because it will be replayed. And if you have the infinite loop, that may be a bug, then you do have a risk of maybe having an infinite bill <laughs> in your Azure, especially if you, you missed the bug, right? Uh, and then you were not not sure and it's running in production. So those things, constraints are really, really good uh, to know. So as you notice here, the orchestrator sleeps, orchestrators wakes up, sleeps, and then sleeps, and then it's like wake, wake up, sleep, wake up, and sleep. It doesn't work for us because we need to sleep straight, right? <laughs> yes, but my point is that uh, the orchestrator, when it's sleeping, it's actually good. It's good because, I mean, of course, that dog is very cute, but it's very good for us in our applications or in in, con in the perspective of saving money because we're actually not paying for the instances or those activities that are not working. You have control of what uh, what 
instances or activities that are to be uh, controlled. And that I, I, that's what I love about uh, durable functions because you can take control of the state. You don't have to worry too much. And it also makes the business people in our teams happy because it can help cut the cost, especially if you really know how to implement it properly because we have to admit that bad design can also cause like incremental costs. So, but uh, my highlight here is that when the orchestrator is really well designed in the orchestrator, it can really help uh, uh, save us money. And I know some project in my IT consulting uh, project that they literally use all Azure functions for the entire system and they literally doesn't have to pay so much in Azure. So it's really about uh, knowing the best uh, solution for something. And of course, uh, developer productivity. We developers who are developers coding here. Oh, everyone. You're an archi architect? Yes, yes, but it, this is good for you. Yeah, but this is also good for you. This, I think this part also is something you could relate, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so developers, or it doesn't matter, uh, there's a, 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 a benefit of um, using serverless solution or event driven. As I said, it really depends on your use case because you cannot use serverless in everything. It actually depends on the use case. Maybe your use case suits well with uh, containers or other solutions. And of course, developer productivity is important for us because we have priorities as developers, right? So. I think <laughs> Sinika is smiling. I think you can relate. <laughs> I can relate to this actually. That's, that's why I'm, I'm sharing this photo a lot in, in my talks in this uh, topic because uh, I can relate to this guy when I found it online. I could really relate to it because as a developer, you we spend a lot of time trying to solve problem in a bug. And if you don't have someone that you pair programming with, sometimes because of the deadlines, you actually end up dreaming about how to solve your code. And sometimes those solution comes unexpected in certain tonight. Like you're like walking with your dog or maybe for this guy while he was taking a shower and he had an idea to fix the bug. But uh, the point is developer productivity. Uh, so because we have priorities. And it's not just developer that has, that needs to be productive, also the business, right? So it's the sales, the, the, the delivery to those that are really using the system. So event driven scaling. Ah, I did show this already. So I think I'm gonna uh, skip that. So the next pattern is the fan out, fan in pattern. Have you, any of you tried it? Yes, what do you think? It's good, we got a thumbs up just to translate to the live viewers. <laughs> we got a thumbs up. Uh, how about uh, side? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, we do have like, just to say, <laughs> we do have a few, uh, one of our uh, community members here that said that uh, fan out fan in is also used in, in the PowerShell, which is also good. Yes, yeah, so as the feedback already we got from everyone, uh, from a few of you, uh, fan out fan in pattern is, as you can see in this pattern, what you do is that you execute multiple functions in parallel like this, oh, this is just only three. And then what you do is that you wait for all those parallel tasks to finish, and then you aggregate everything in, into one. And this is actually a good pattern uh, to me because there are times that we need to run parallel stuff at the same time without losing its state. And this is not easy to do if you have uh, normal functions that doesn't have state. So, so th there are certain scenarios that this is really useful. And I believe maybe in like uh, telemetry or monitoring, there's a lot of use case scenarios that you can use this uh, with uh, as well. 
And in terms of code example or snippet, so let's see. So here, uh, C Sharp, uh, uh, everyone is C Sharp developers. I mean, not everyone, but yeah, you, you, I will just try to share. Uh, so you, you, you just ask, ask questions now or later if, <laughs> if you, if you want me to like help clarify later, but, uh, and then you will get a copy of the presentation later through, uh, through the community. So what we're trying to do here in the fan out fan and pattern is that, um, so your function name is fan out fan in. So you have your orchestration context. So what you're trying to do here is that you are trying to create objects of, of your task. And what you're trying to you or you're trying to do that by calling function one or a function. And then once you get the work batch that you need to do, you're gonna loop through it and then do something about it by calling function two in each of them. And then when all of those tasks are done, you're gonna aggregate it. And this is the aggregation part, this line of code, task when all, this is the ag the fun in part comes in. And uh, this, in this example, is just trying to do a sum of a simple, um, like counting maybe. But you can do this in other real use case uh, scenarios as well. And it could be like a document uh, thing, uh, like doc document use case or something in your application that can be uh, applicable. The next one is the async HTTP API, which is actually useful for like long running operations, usually used for external clients. So here you can use this in a simple example. So you can actually use the word or the instance of durable HTTP response. So if you see the word durable, it means that it's not just like the ordinary HTTP response. So you call or create an instance of durable HTTP response, use, and this is in a sync method. And through the durable orchestration context, you can call uh, this instance, uh, call HTTP async, and then you choose what kind of HTTP method that you need to use. It can be get, post, post, yeah, the, the typical HTTP method. And here, I passed in my URL, but this URL can be your API call that's getting data through and then returns the JSON file or JSON uh, object. But the point that I have here that this keyword, I mean, this this library is useful when you're trying to have this like long running uh, like calls uh, through H HTTP API that's a sync. So you can choose to check what's the response by status, status code. So you all know that 500 status code, it means uh, there's a server error. And uh, otherwise, if you don't get this like very critical errors, you can process further the response status code. Uh, you can get that. Maybe it's that 200, you know, 200 is good. So if you get 200, you can do reverse the if condition here and then get the content that you passed in from that call. And this call is just like Jonah's website. It's very simple, but there are other APIs that can return good data from other systems. And of course you can do the catch, uh, the, the error handling. How long will it wait? Uh, actually, it, it, it really, it should, it should give a response right away. But if you have, if you need to have uh, like a, like a control about, about what's going on in the time, there's actually a, a class or a method in durable functions called durable timer. So you can create like a durable timer and then you can set a timeout uh, for that. I mean, usually it, it you get a response like when you call an API from Postman for example you get a response right away but sometimes the server is taking long and you need to know what response hey what's going on I need a number is it 500 is it 200 
and things like that. But if your function keeps on waiting and you want to take control on your side, then you can use the, the timer, durable timer. I, can, I think there's an example of that uh, on one of the patterns. I hope that answered your question. Yes, <laughs> great. Uh, next one pattern is the monitor pattern. And usually as you, you see in its description, it's like if you're trying to create a stateful workflow, for a recurring process and usually it's like doing pulling job jobs that you need to do until a specific conditions are met and one example of this is like a function that monitors a job status of course you have the context what you're trying to do is uh your create your variables here to get your uh expiration time and in your while loop, actually your expiration time, you actually decide how long it needs to expire. And what it does is it's trying to get the job status here. And then when it is completed, it's gonna do its job that it needs to be done. And that, in that case, I say call activity, send alert. So when that job is completed, it's gonna send an alert. It passed in the machine ID. And this send alert is another activity functions that has logic itself and it means send alert, maybe send an email or maybe send an alert to a device or a UI in any way. So this is like, uh, like there's no specific, uh, like you use this for that. It really depends on what you want to do after this job is done. So this is just an example. And then the monitoring part here is that until uh, you can ha you can keep this going, and then the active the orchestration act orchestrator actually sleeps until your next pooling interval. So this pooling interval that you have here was actually the one that you declared in another function. So maybe you want this monitoring job to pull every twenty four hours or every number of hours. So you can decide that uh, from here. And then this is the one that I told you about. I mean, the, you can actually create a timer. And the durable timer is can be created through the I orchestration uh, context. Uh, that is a method that allows you to like check. I mean, declare passing variables when do you want to do the next check, and then your cancellation uh, token as well. So that was the monitoring pattern. The next pattern is the human interaction pattern. As you know, uh, human interaction. So it means it need, needs us humans. And uh, it is uh, typically used in automating like uh, processes, like uh, like approval processes uh, that requires human interaction, of course. So let's just say this one. So let's just say I have a request for something to be approved. And sometimes in our real business, the real case scenario, we require someone to really like verify uh, everything and then approve. But that person might be on summer vacation uh, somewhere. And maybe that person is very special that he or she needs to be the approver. But then you can actually automate the business process by setting conditions in advance and say, Hey, if Jonah is out on speaking in a conference or Asher's corner, <laughs> what you can do if she doesn't reply in 24 hours, you have a durable timer that says, hey, durable timer, do this for Jonah instead, escalate this or do something else or pass into another Jonah too or something. So that process is possible using the human interaction pattern with the help of a durable uh, timer. And this is how it actually looks as an example by code. C sharp again, since uh, I'm a C sharp lover. <laughs> PowerShell, PowerShell soon, maybe. <laughs> All right, so this is the approval workflow example. So let's just say you're, you're waiting for a call from, as you see, there is a, a, a method here called request approval. And you're waiting for that like activity to happen. So you do have this timeout that you said. So th this one is a durable timer, as you can see. 
And in the durable timer, you choose the due time. In this case, that's 72 hours uh, timeout. And then what it does is that you have an if condition. So let's just say that you have an approval event that requires uh, an external thing to happen. And that is, this approval event can be like uh, someone replying to the email or clicking a button, uh, literally a person. So human approval here. But if, when actually, when any of this event happens in parallel with the durable timeout, then what it does is that it's gonna process the approval depending on whatever comes first. Otherwise, you're going to do the escalation thing or call another uh, activity uh, like escalation or do something else. The next one is the stateful entities that I've told you about, like related to uh, .NET. So I did actually add uh, the QR code for durable entities because this is the topic itself that, that has a lot of like great content in it. So I recommend you checking it out later when I send the presentation. But what it does, this pattern uh, is useful, especially in .NET for state, state, stateful entities, is that it aggregates uh, data from the events into like one entity. So this, this data, event data can be coming from different sources or different events. And it's trying to capture it like one entity. And this is hard to actually do, especially if you, you don't have a stateful uh, like a workflow. So this is a good one, especially if you're .NET developer, I really recommend this uh, to try it out. So you do actually see here, this is just a simple example of an event trigger uh, using C Sharp. And what it does, it's, it's actually trying to get the events from device sensor. And it has, instead of using the durable client, like the normal functions, the durable entities or stateful entities actually uses this class, iDurable Entity Client. So that's what it does. And then you can actually assign uh, like entities uh, to them. Not pizza is here. Yes, <laughs> good. <laughs> All right. So those are the patterns that we have, six uh, documented. But there are sub or there are patterns that you can do uh, different patterns with it because in an orchestration, you can also create sub orchestration. So it can be as complex as you want and it can be something that can suit your use case scenario. So here you have your client function, your orchestrator, and in, in your orchestrator, you can actually code or create sub -orchestra orchestrators. You can have several orchestrators or workflows within it and each sub orchestrator has its own purpose or group of activities or tasks that uh, it can do. And I believe currently uh, it is supported only in a few languages, not all languages for uh, Azure functions. Are we still good in time? Yes, wrap up soon, okay, sure. Yes, yes, that's good. So uh, sub orchestration uh, this is how it looks. The keyword that we have here is the call sub orchestration async. So if you're doing that, uh, and then what you can do is you can call your sub orchestration uh, name. So the purpose of sub orchestration, clean code, uh, it's easier to manage more organization and you can reuse your workflow across your own workflow, the main one. And aside from sub orchestration, you can actually have eternal orchestration. So you can actually create, or yeah, forever loop, <laughs> but not, but more controlled to be honest. So you have, you can create eternal orchestration and if you need to stop it, there's also different ways to stop the instance of that by logic. So that's also good to know if you want something to keep uh, running. Developing Azure Functions, the basic, basic usual stuff that we use. Uh, the, you can uh, code it, uh, you can build it using infrastructure as code, but you can also 
de de develop it in the standard tools in these libraries. And of course, you need to have the latest func uh, Azure function uh, core tools to get most of the new updates that they have. Error handling, these are the things that you need to consider. Uh, as me I mentioned, the typical try-catch block. Uh, if you want to control on failure, just like what you said, you don't know, you want to take control. Durable timer is good, as I said, but uh, you can also use the feature in the context to call activity with retry, and it can be, it's going to be a sync uh, as well. And of course, monitoring is also important in terms of observability. Uh, this is exactly what I mean. So if you have published your Azure functions, you actually have logs, log streaming uh, behind it. So you can actually see what's going on behind the scenes of your production Azure functions. And you can track the applications log, application logs and the web server uh, logs. And then there is also live stream if you want to see this, the real stream of data. Uh, behind the scenes in Azure Functions, so you see the live metrics. See, I mean, stream actually shows the outgoing and the overall uh, health of your functions, and you do see or you can trace the telemetry behind behind it. That one I will skip because where pizza maybe is gonna get cold, and I wanna skip that. I did actually just wanna show you that. I was involved in uh, in a project where uh, I had to use Azure Functions to to develop uh, the DevOps solution. So uh, there were a solution to solve Azure Functions to use Azure Functions and call the API, and this is to automate uh, the the sending of uh, release notes. So I used a service bus, and then actually they asked me to solve the problem. I used the fan out, fan in method. And this, let me just fast forward this because uh, we're out of time. But so what I did is that I used a timer method, an orchestrator function uh, to fan out the things that I need to do in that DevOps commits and pipelines and Bitbucket. I aggregated it and then I saved the, I used another function to generate a release notes use service bus and send grid API to send out those release notes email that I used to do manually uh, in my in my job because they were in different system. And then I did uh, auto scheduling of release notes email as a DevOps like release manager in, in, in this project to solve the problem and to use the service bus and then the fan out fan in a, uh, pattern again to automate the sending of the email and uh, the find out part of it. If you're uh, new to serverless development, I recommend Azure IoT Dev Kit and go to Nico's upcoming event here uh, through Azure Scona because it's really a good way for you to get started with event-driven development in serverless with uh, Azure. So I do have this one, so I use it to hack a bit about uh, like uh, IoT stuff within the cloud. And it's available on this QR code if you're curious to try and develop with it, with Azure IoT. I'll skip the demo and I want to highlight that try to solve problems, whatever it is in your projects, by automating tasks if possible and try to use Azure, <laughs> your Azure or serverless technologies if possible and do work less with serverless, right? <laughs> and uh, check out Azure Functions, uh, scan this QR code for Microsoft Learn Docs uh, if you want to learn more about it because I'm, I'm actually introducing you the concepts right now but you learn by doing in your real projects. So that's how we learn. And then uh, there are, there are tools to check uh, through this QR code, .NET, Azure DevOps, Durable Functions. And if you want to read my book and get the 30-day complimentary free access of the digital version, uh, feel free to scan the QR or grab a bookmark there, actually, and other stickers from the community. Azure is going to for everyone when we get pizza. And that's all. Talk to me, and yeah, thank you. And scan the QR if you want to connect or ask more questions later. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jonna. Yes. <laughs> so serverless is a really cool thing. You can try it out. Uh, I know the, the food is waiting for you, so let's keep it short. And yes. uh, thank you, Jonna, and we can discuss more while we eat. Yes, let's Kay. do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for bra. <laughs>